So hello back boys and girls, welcome to my philosophy YouTube cast and I want to study more logic because I want to disregard my emotions and acquire more logic. Um, and that is because I study a lot of analytic articles and though I had a logics course during my Bachelor of Philosophy and I also read several logic books, for example, of Quine, I still feel not equipped to read a lot of articles in analytic philosophy and also of Robert Brandom. And I always wonder... Is that because I have studied not enough logic? Yes, of course. And so, yeah, I looked into an article and it says the best books on logic by Tom Stoneham. So and Tom Stoneham is a British philosopher. Um, I don't know him. And he is at the University of York, head of the department. And I'm not sure if he's qualified to do logic, but it seems he has taught it very often he has not written a book of logic why that he describes in this article and here it says logic is an excellent form of mind training do we need mind training or should we rather focus on practical tasks where we train our mind i wonder i always wonder should we practice our mind just randomly and get lumosity for example so in the book he recommends is Logic Primer, then Logic by Wilfred Hodges, Paradoxes by Sainsbury, and the Tractatus Philosophicus of Ludwig Wittgenstein, which I read, but I feel it didn't really prepare me for understanding all these logical discussions and then the philosophy of logic. I think I read that. I don't remember if I read that in full anymore, but I read that when I had a course on Quine during my bachelor studies with Professor Anscott. Okay, and then he goes through and uh, he explains a lot about the problems or the motivations for doing logics. So, and what is logic about? If we think one thing is true, then we may be committed to thinking something else is true. The most common conception of formal logic is that it's saying all languages have this interest in truth. So, and the point is when I somehow admit that a certain statement is true, then usually from that follows that also other statements are true. And that is what logic is concerned with. Logic, however, is not concerned with which sentences are true. It's concerned with patterns of truth. And this involves asserting truths, making statements is often the favorite phrase. The question is, what are the relationships between these different statements? So logic studies the relationships between true claims. It is a very particular conception of argument that we've appealed to here, the idea that we are moving from some truths to more truths. So if you get one truth and you're good at logic, you can actually get more truths. This involves a concept of validity and argument is valid. Logicians say when we have one set of statements which we call the premises and if they are true, then this other statement, the conclusion must be true and cannot be false. And uh, this is a famous concept. It's called truth preservation. What he says is this truth pr preservation says it's less about which statements are true than how to keep to the truth once you've got a true statement. So if you get true premises, is it justified to make a certain conclusion on these true premises? And if the premises are true or not, does not really play the role. For example, you can say uh, the moon is made of bad cheese, rotten cheese. And you can say rotten cheese is edible. So we have two premises. And then we can say, therefore, the moon is edible. And I had a student, she always said, but the moon is not made of cheese. So let's say it's made of edible cheese, right? And I said, yeah, but if it were, <laughs> then you could eat it. So she didn't understand that it's about truth preservation. It was really hard to explain to that to her. But thinking in these conditionals, that's one of the 
capabilities of our mind that makes us so strong. We can think something through that we may not even think to be the truth at this very moment. And then he says, okay, but there are also logical truths that are the, pres uh, pr um, the presumptions of this logical thinking. And for example, one is the law of the excluded middle, which we hopefully discuss a little bit later. So, and formal truths, they stand somehow in contrast to natural languages. So in natural languages, we let meaning develop and emerge, and then dictionaries try to capture some of what and some of that, and we discover how rich and complex it is, and so on. I don't like when people say so on. But the idea is that formal languages, they try to define the meaning at first, and then just to proceed from what is already known. What formal logic tries to do is say, there's all this richness and complexity in natural language, let's introduce some special terms and symbols where we all agree on these explicit terms and explicit definitions and rules for using them. This begins the process, sometimes called symbolization, sometimes called formalization, where we go from a bit of natural language, it could be any language, and we convert it into these new symbols and terms and explicit definitions. So the task of logic is to be precise and accurate and to proceed from true statements to more truths so that we have more reason to believe that we actually hold a truth. Um, so many people are often tricked. Let me, let me see if I find uh, the example of Aristotle. I think that's, that's a very funny meme, um, which shows <laughs> some of the tricks. Yeah, here is Aristotle. Who's Aristotle, you may say. Um, let's just pull out the image. Uh, I may be a bit slow in doing that. Okay, here we go. Hello, there we go. So, Aristotle says in this first picture, Man is by nature a political animal. I, a political animal, am therefore a man. <laughs> and that sounds true, right? And then somebody says, I feel like that's not a valid syllogism. And then Aristotle just flips out and says, well, that's my logic. <laughs> okay. So, but the idea here is that we obviously sometimes follow some ideas and we think it's logical, but it's not. So man is by nature a political animal. That's the premise. And then we have, I am a political animal. But this is a logical fallacy because you try... Um, so man includes political animal, but political animal does not include man. So that's a problem here. And the idea is that if you bring it in formalization, if you formalize this argument, then you can show more easily that that is false and also prove that that is false. So effectively, formal logic is a very general form of algebra. And, of course, that includes a lot of problems. So, for example, how do we define the logical function of OR? Do we say logical, the logical operator of OR? That may be more correct. Or how is it also called? In math, it's called operator. I think in logic, we call that a logical constant because it does not change its meaning. So, yeah, he says uh, way more on that. And then the book he recommends is The Logic Primer by Colin Allen. And he says, a lot of people write their own book and there is no good logical book. But this logical book here is interesting because it doesn't say everything. I like it because it doesn't explain anything. I think he means, I like it because it does not explain everything. This sounds a bit wrong, right? But I'm not a native English speaker. Okay. It's simple but fascinating almost from a sociological or psychological point of view to see somebody thinking that clearly or organizing things that clearly. 
It's almost like a surgeon getting ready to perform an operation. The scalpels are in this tray. The sutures are here. It's all clearly organized. So it's, it gives you the instruments. Uh, but then he says, most logic textbooks try to soften the blow of what a formal language is like and how explicit and rule-bound it is by giving lots of examples, by trying to make it feel natural and comfortable. Many logic lecturers do the same. They're worried that people are going to be put off. And so they try to say, it's okay. This isn't too far out of your comfort zone. Whereas in this logic book, Logic Primer, we doesn't have any of that at all. Just says, here it is, bare bones, follow the rules, it'll all work. And then we have, I've never taught formal logic, but I've taught critical thinking. There's a problem that whatever example you use, students get caught up in the details of the example. Forget we're talking about the particular move or paradox or whatever it is. And I agree with that. Very often students expect that you explain every little detail and every little from every little perspective. And sometimes it's about being thrown into the water. Especially what I believe when you learn languages, you have to move fast. If you move slow, you won't learn language. Okay, and without further ado, I suggest that we go to the other book that he called For All X, An Introduction to Formal Logic. And we start reading that, and then I also try to find the book primer. That should be it for this small session. Join me the next time. Subscribe if you want to read more about logic and think about. Let me know in the comments if I said something wrong about logic. I'm not an expert on that field. I'm just probably going to work in the logics department. Therefore, I want to prepare myself a little bit more by reading textbooks of logic. I won't do logic. I won't become a logician, but I feel I need, I need a ref refreshment. I need to refresh my mind uh, and to recall some of the logical concepts. Therefore, I just start reading an introductory book. But I hope that somehow it goes deeper into the matter. If you want to join me reading the book from time to time, I also read other philosophical books in a wild order, then please join this channel. Bye-bye.